Good, Good evening. I would like to call this May 8th, 2023, Sylvania Board of Education meeting to order. Um, call the roll, please. Ms. Hoffman? Here. Mrs. Conklin? Here. Mrs. Lavalette? Here. Mr. Feller? Here. Mrs. Johnson? Here. Stand for the pledge, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, I think first on our agenda this evening um, is our TransPower presentation, Dr. Motley. That is correct. We have the pleasure of having Micah Brassfield here from TransPower, which is a third party organization, a business that actually um, is quite prevalent in the industry. And she is going to present um, the results of our transportation efficiency study uh, for our audience and for our Board of Education tonight. I do have hard copies if you would like them. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Do you want to? Um, Micah, thank you for coming. I hope you had safe travels, and I should say in this day and age, an, a timely travel. Absolutely. Left on time, landed on time, and we'll leave out on time. Absolutely. That's very important these days. No so, thank, thank you for being here in Sylvania. I believe you came to us all the way from I came from Texas, that's Texas. correct. Yes, okay. so welcome. This time it's not snowing. The last time you were in the district, that's right. we had a snow day, the only snow day we had all year, which our, teach, our students have expressed disappointment in my ch decision making with that, but regardless, we're glad you're here to sunny Ohio, so welcome. Thank you, Dr. Motley. And members of the board, thank you for having me this evening. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, before we get started, I want to share a little bit about who Transpar is and who I am, uh, how I came to be in the transportation industry. Transpar has been around for 27 years, uh, helping districts across the nation uh, with a variety of student transportation needs. Uh, we provide management and staffing services literally to districts from Hawaii to Rhode Island uh, as we manage the entire statewide system for the Department of Education for Hawaii and Rhode Island, um, as well as managing other uh, districts of multiple sizes from Texas, Oklahoma, Missouri, Tennessee, Indiana, Pennsylvania, New York. Um, and then we work directly with districts from a consulting and advisory perspective to help them assess their transportation operations and to really help uh, educate both the districts and the community um, on the challenges that, that are present when running a transportation operation and, and what it takes to run a transportation operation successfully. Um, I actually grew up in the transportation industry. My father is a 40-year veteran who started as a bus driver in 1982, uh, literally worked through nearly every position up to now being an executive director of transportation for a large district in Texas. Um, and so the industry is near and dear to my heart and, and I've had a lot of time uh, both in being a previous educator as a secondary uh, high school English teacher and coach, um, as well as working on the operations side directly for school districts overseeing their student transportation, child nutrition, and custodial operations um, to really have an understanding of the in intricacies and the complexities that districts face when uh, specifically trying to operate a student transportation system. This was a very uh, in-depth study in terms of collecting quite a bit of data, and I would be remiss if I didn't start by thanking uh, the Transportation Department under Mr. Wolpert for having us uh, come out, did a number of um, collection of data prior to coming on site, spent some time on site with two different members of our team, myself being one of them. Um, and I can tell you that the transparency and the candor with which uh, a process like this takes um, is not always easy for the Transportation Department, uh, but they were um, great partners through these, these effort of conducting the route efficiency study. And so we'll share with you just a high level summary of that information this evening. We were engaged uh, to do a couple of different tasks within this project, first being the route efficiency study in which we did a time and capacity utilization analysis of each run, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through the presentation. The second portion of the work that we were um, engaged to do was Route Finder Plus training, which is the district's routing software, uh, which was newly implemented last year, and uh, some of the routers on our team, we work with a variety of routing softwares, but we have uh, one of the foremost users of the Route Finder Plus software, which is provided by 
by TransFinder um, and, and sent that member of our team on site to work directly with the transportation department um, on site for a week to provide some additional training and to uh, help assess the system and to make sure that the system um, has the information that it needs um, and that the users are being able to use it to its full potential. Just a quick overview of this, this project uh, to date. We started this work back in December in terms of off-site data collection. We came on site uh, for the actual route yield, which is the time and capacity utilization um, data collection process in January. I spent some time working with the, the transportation department to review the data, to go back through and do some quality assurance and quality control of the information that was collected and provided by the drivers. Um, and that took through uh, the end of March. And then we uh, culminated the presentation, put together the summary that you're reviewing, um, and are sharing that with you this evening. One of the things that I want to call your attention to is, is really sharing what we're seeing uh, primarily over the last three years and having worked with districts post the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and the number of districts nationwide who are actually experiencing the need to cancel routes um, has increased significantly, and that's a product of many factors. Um, we are in an unprecedented unprecedented national school bus driver shortage. Um, as I said, I grew up around the industry and I can tell you uh, without, a fact, without a doubt that this is one of the most difficult and most severe school bus driver shortages that, that the nation has experienced. Sylvania is not alone. Uh, thousands of districts, nearly every district you will see um, that is posting uh, the need to hire drivers. Uh, in general, this is not the only industry that is experiencing labor shortages. Uh, the economic conditions are, are challenging and so the costs of both operating your student transportation operation as as well as trying to find uh, the staff that can fill these positions that are required is incredibly difficult. And we're seeing that, again, nearly in every district that we're working with currently. Um, and it has been pretty pretty significant over the course of the last, last three years. And one of the key things that, that we note um, and that we like to call to, to the district's mind um, as we do these types of studies is whether or not you are having to cancel routes. Because we are seeing widespread cancellations. Oftentimes, the calls that we get from districts are because they are having to cancel bus service um, and they don't have a method of, of being able to provide service to all students in any other manner than being able to either rotate through service for different areas at different times or to, or to cancel service altogether until they are staffed adequately. Specific to Sylvania, um, the part of the challenges that they're facing and, and, and what we noted in being on site uh, collecting data throughout this process. Um, there are challenges with long-term absences. Even though you may have a number of drivers listed on your roster, if they're out for long-term medical absences, uh, those drivers are not available to you to drive. Um, there have been four routes since the beginning of the year that, that have, do not have designated drivers, but they're covered on a daily basis, uh, primarily by the staff in the office who is driving on a daily basis to make sure that they're not having to cancel routes. It doesn't mean that, that bus routes are not are, are always running on time, but they're doing everything that they can to avoid canceling those routes and co covering them with staff members from the operations staff, routers, the directors that you see here tonight. Um, that is how they are avoiding having to cancel routes, even in the absence of having enough drivers or drivers who call in and are, are no-shows. Um, and then the, the last part that, that's important to note for student transportation operations, every district is very unique in the way that they must operate their transportation system. And, and quite a bit of that is dictated by uh, local and state law. Um, every district has different requirements in terms of who is eligible for transportation. And so Sylvania specifically is complex in the requirements for Ohio state law in terms of who needs to be provided transportation and the policies that dictate uh, the way in which routes must be structured um, are, are also another contributing factor to the complexity of the system in its current state. From a very general perspective, there are many factors that are impacting route efficiency within a school district. And so some of the high level factors are your bell times and your instructional lengths of day, which we'll talk about more here shortly. Again, your eligibility and policies, and that can be your local policies all the way up to your state laws. Um, the geography and distance between schools is a very uh, significant factor in terms of how routes must be structured and the time that you actually have to fill and reuse a bus as many times as possible. That, that's what allows a transportation system to be efficient, to be able to fill and reuse that same bus as often as possible. The number of drivers and buses is, is probably the, the pinnacle in terms of efficiency. You can plan a perfectly operated system that, that gets everybody to school safely on time, but if you don't have enough drivers to operate the system um, or you're having to combat absenteeism or driver turnover, it completely dismantles the efficiency of your system. 
And then last but not least, obviously the number of schools uh, and the students that you're transporting and, and then the time frame in which you need to transport those students. So route planning at its foundation starts with your state laws, your policies that are, that are locally dictated and how those bus routes are able to be combined often are a product of both state law and policy. Some of the key uh, laws that, that are called out that really frame um, how transportation is to be provided in Ohio are noted there in 3327.01 and 02 and 3301. Um, and, and specifically without getting into the nuances uh, at a high level, we're talking about providing transportation to uh, students K through eight residing two miles or more from the school they attend. Um, Non-public school students for those that are less than 30 minutes direct travel time from a school bus during normal travel times is measure, measured by school to a school building, uh, which the student would be assigned to eligible public and non-public community school students. And then as far as the structure of the buses themselves and the bus routes themselves, um, law dictates that students K through eight may walk up to one half mile to a designated bus stop. So this is just to demonstrate that there are very, very specific um, pieces of law that, that help frame what, what districts in Ohio are able to do or, or should consider as they put together their transportation plans. Uh, another part of state law that is important to note is that districts do have the ability to, when needed to declare a route as being impractical. Um, and that can be for a number of, of uh, factors that are enumerated by state law, but at a high level if the district feels that they don't have the ability to provide transportation, uh, then they do have the opportunity to declare that route as impractical um, and to go through other processes to offer payment in lieu of to parents. As we talked about the complexities earlier, one of the key things to note is that traditional transportation, and when I say traditional transportation, we, we think of uh, school buses who serve students who live in a specific area, and they're all going to the same school. They live in a neighborhood that, that they're eligible because of the distances at, at which they live from their school, and now they are able to be transported directly to that school. We're seeing, and, and this was prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, not only in, in states that dictate that students who reside within the district uh, but can attend non-public or private or parochial schools. In addition to that, we are seeing a, a rise in districts who are allowing choice programs. Um, and those choice programs allow students to attend any, any school within the district, but it makes traditional transportation, the ability to just go from your home area directly to your school, much more difficult. Um, and so when students are not attending their public schools, their, their neighborhood schools, uh, then you get some additional complexities in how your routes have to be structured. Within the routing methodology analysis, what Transpar looked at was what were some of these complexities. Um, for Sylvania schools, it operates for 12 public schools, but it's serving up to 22 non-public schools as well. Um, and this varies, that number varies based on, on placement. If a student resides within the district and requests uh, other schools that are not in the current list, those can be added. Uh, but 17 of the non-public schools that are currently being transported to are without or outside of Sylvania's d current district boundary. Um, to achieve the goal of providing transportation, routes are tried are performed in three tiers currently. Um, and those three tiers are what's allowing in current state based on uh, your bell times for your public and non-public schools, uh, based on the distance at which you must travel, the grouping of, of bus routes in the current tiers is what's allowing the provision of service in as efficient a manner as possible currently. So there are strategic collection points that Sylvania operates with that are very similar uh, in nature to what we would call a, a hub and spoke system um, or uh, those that, that would somewhat mirror a, a transit system when, when necessary. Um, when you have school schools that are located outside of the school district's boundaries, you're looking to try to collect as many students as possible to get them as close to those schools as possible. But because students can literally live anywhere in the district and attend a school that is not in their home area, what you're required to do is, is very similar, again, to either a hub and spoke system um, or a depot-based system where you use routes that can traverse the entire district to collect as many students as possible to bring them into a central location and then to redistribute them to their respective non-public school areas. 
Um, the way that, that Sylvania is currently operating its system is to use on that first tier your high schools, which because this, the district has two high schools, divides the district into two separate boundaries for those high schools, but has those routes covering the largest geographic area in which it can go out and collect all of the students who reside across the district, bringing them back to the high schools as collection points and then redistributing them on routes that can efficiently get to some of those non-public non school locations. Um, again, high school routes, due to the coverage of the larger attendance areas, they can be utilized more efficiently in time and capacity than any of your other routes. And because high school's on the first tier, it's, it also allows us to serve the students that are attending some of these non-public schools that have the same bell time starts, which we'll look at here closely, um, here shortly. In the second tier, we also have middle school collection points because middle schools are your next largest geographic area in terms of attendance zones. Um, and so your middle school collection points as well um, as St. Joseph's Parish School, as well as Apostolic Christian Academy are those that represent more centralized locations to be collection points to try to, again, take students who can reside anywhere in the district and need to come into a, a place where that they where they can be redistributed more efficiently. Um, that that is the method in which you can currently provide transportation in the most efficient manner possible. Uh, this method again is referred to as hub and spoke because it, it essentially are going out to locations. It's coming back into a central location and then it's redistributing through through uh, the spokes of a wheel. Um, varying school start times and start and end times are what makes this the most difficult, and we're, we'll talk more about that here shortly. Just for everyone to visualize what, what I just spoke about, the perimeter of this map, as you can see, is the black dots, and that represents the district's boundary. Within the district boundary, you will see the stars that represent a non-public school location, and then the small uh, pink box that looks like has a flag on it as a public school location. Um, and then the areas that are collection points are those that are circled in green. So you'll notice that those are very strategically located because they represent either the northern or southern portion of the district or the most centralized locations to which, again, anyone who lives within that box that's designated by the black dots, if they're needing to travel to a non-public school location, which you can see is primarily on the far side of the map and outside of the district boundary, it makes the most sense to utilize those first tier routes, which are your high school routes that cover the entire district to collect students who can reside anywhere within the district to bring them into those collection points that would then allow them to be more effectively distributed throughout the district. We'll go to the second map here shortly, but 17 of the non-public schools that, that we're currently providing transportation to are outside of the district boundaries and are not even able to be featured in, in the map. So here's a, a broader view, a, a more bird's eye level view of this map expanded. So now the district's boundary is the box at the top of the screen there. The red circle is encapsulating uh, many of those schools that could not be shown in the previous map, and, and those are a large number of schools that the Transportation Department is currently providing transportation to. Um, again, those non-public schools, just, just to note, because of the size and the scale of the map, one star could potentially represent two schools. Um, it, it's just reflecting the area, the general area in what the, which those schools are located. And then again, you can see where they are in proximity to the public school locations. So again, as you think about where students could potentially reside as far as the box is concerned, they can live anywhere within that boundary, but they all, for the most part, are being transported to a location that may reside outside of the boundary as far as non-public schools are concerned. And so again, the most efficient method to be able to do that currently is to operate with a transfer or hub and spoke type system. We'll briefly talk about what route yield is, but this is the process that we engaged in on site where we collected driver surveys, and this is an actual time and capacity utilization analysis in which drivers are required to fill in information of what actually occurs on a route that day. The best laid plans in transportation are those that are made in the routing software, but as any transportation professional can tell you, those plans can immediately fall apart through a number of things that are outside of your control on any, any given day. It can be weather, it could be traffic, and, and more often than not, 
not, it's the, the shortage of drivers and it's the daily absenteeism. Um, and so what we do is we come in to do an actual representative snapshot. We don't take just what's in the routing software and say, okay, what was planned is what's actually happening. Route yield is to go in and assess time and capacity of every run in order to determine where, where are there any runs that are under 60% utilized in time and capacity. What that indicates to us is if we see that a run is underutilized by 60% in time and capacity, in theory, we should have time to add more students or we should have time to add more stops. And that would also indicate to us maybe there, there is some slack in the system. Maybe there is the opportunity to become more efficient. So we go through, we collect the data, we do a quality assurance control process in which we go through every run that maybe we have questions about with the transportation department, enter that information into the system so that that run can be analyzed and determined, again, is it, is it efficient in current state? And if not, why not? What at a very high level, and again, this is without getting into the full-blown study, but at a very high level, what we found with the route yield analysis, first and foremost, is that the average bus runs in the morning were 30 minutes in length, in the afternoon were 27 minutes in length. And the standard deviation of those runs was anywhere between 8 and 11 minutes. What that indicates to us, first and foremost, is that there is a constraint in time, particularly in the afternoon. This would mean that in order to operate efficiently and to make sure every bus had enough time to operate based on those average route lengths, that you would need at least 45 minutes between clearly delineated bus tiers. And then when I say clearly delineated, you would need to be able to group schools in a fashion that they had the same standard lengths of day in order to operate what we would consider to be a clean cut three-tier, four-tier, two-tier system, whatever it may be. But because there are so many varying lengths of instructional day and it's such a variety of start and end times, it's, it's nearly impossible for you to group schools in a manner that allows you to assign specific buses solely to individual campuses, individual schools, and then to go on to the next tier, as, as you would see in a true three-tier, four-tier system. The varying lengths of day, would need to be uh, discussed and, and collectively uh, worked with w among the public and non-public schools to see if there could be alignment. But much of that is dictated by the individual schools. And so the, again, that requires either concession of everyone having the same length of day um, and the ability to get everyone in collective agreement on who would go first, second, or third, uh, maybe even fourth if you if you did operate with a four-tier system. But those established bell time pil pillars are what directly impact transportation from the outset before we even start talking about how the routes themselves are structured. So this graph speaks volumes. First, you have 29 different start and end times across all of the public and non-public schools that Sylvania provides transportation to. Uh, for many of the districts that we work with we, we, that have challenges in which they are limited in their ability to become more efficient, it starts with bell times. Uh, from the bell times currently, they range in the morning, and you can see a, a much cleaner taper on the front end in terms of there are some groupings, but the back end is what is particularly problematic in that you have such a staggered and jagged end to the day that there is not enough time in the afternoon particularly in between that approximately 2.30 to 3.50 time frame for buses to completely unload, go to another tier, and that too is a part of what requires the, the use of hub and spoke type systems. Um, Sylvania, again, and its non-public partners would have to try to find a way to align the links of day first. It's not just about the start and end times. To be able to align the links of day first to then be able to strategically group those schools into a first, second, and third tier. And by doing so, you would then also need, going back to the standard deviation and the average route length, 45 minutes between those clearly grouped tiers. But that orchestration and that coordination would be um, a collective conversation among all of the non-public and the public schools to determine is there a way for those bell times to be aligned and those links of day to be aligned. So at a high level as far as what the routing methodology analysis revealed is the process of routing itself can be more efficient and there are things that we spent time with the routing team in terms of the many tedious tasks that happen in the routing software um, to help them 
do the route planning in a more efficient manner, but the routes themselves, based on the restrictions and the constraints of the instructional lengths of day, the bell times, um, and the inability to affect change in those bell times currently, they're very limited opportunity to become more efficient in current state. The other part of the challenge is, again, where students reside in proximity to the student and to, to the schools that they're choosing to attend. Um, another key point is that right now, Sylvania does an incredible job of trying to provide a very high level of service to students in where it places its bus stops. State law allows for you to place bus stops at half a mile from students. Um, that's currently not being done. There would be, in order to become more efficient, there are many routes that do have a large number of stops on them because we're trying to stop more closely to student homes. To become more efficient, routes have a strategic number of stops that are placed at clear intervals in centralized locations to allow that bus to not make multiple stops in a manner that makes it less efficient. So that would be a consideration that would have to be made if we're talking about in current state trying to find efficiencies. But outside of that, the way that the routes are currently constructed um, and the ability to condense runs goes back to your ability to, again, streamline your bell time, standardize those lengths of day, um, and then still looking at the challenges in terms of where students reside in proximity to the, the schools that they're attending. The system review, uh, again, in itself, part of what um, you know, I, I want to emphasize here is that the routing software is, is a product of the information that you have to put into it. Again, it's dictated by the policies that you put in place. Um, and so those, those are things that, that we've worked with the transportation team to make sure that they're effectively represented within the routing software. Uh, but as far as the, routes, the route structures themselves, Again, without being able to uh, change or modify some of the things that are currently outside of Sylvania schools control, um, the route structures essentially, they are what they are in current state. Um, one of the things that we do note for the, the Sylvania department specifically is that the routing, staff, the routing staffing function is currently understaffed and they're working through that currently. That would be an area where just having um, you know, additional support by being able to hire another person would help. Uh, and they're currently working through that. So that was one thing that we noted just in terms of how we assess routes. We say for most districts, any district that has more than 50 routes needs at least two routers, particularly to divide the regular education and special education function. So that was an area that we noted within our analysis as well. Last here, and before we get to the uh, conclusion recommendations, it, just in terms of calling out what did route yield itself reveal, there were 195 runs that did show that they, had, they were underutilized in terms of time and capacity. But when you look at what it would take and what we would normally rec recommend is, okay, let's look at these 195 runs. A run does not mean that you can pull a bus off of the road. Those 195 runs are representative of a, a it could be the first, second, and third tier in the morning and the afternoon. You have to be able to consolidate a full route, meaning that you can pull that bus out of every single tier before it can come off the road. But what we found in each of those, those situations, primarily in the afternoon, is that there was not a way to consolidate it by adding more time because you have about 25 minutes between tiers in the afternoon. So until you're able to, again, align and standardize those bell times, you don't have enough time in the afternoon to remove runs from the system. You're running the number of runs that you have to in order to provide service to students. The other, other opportunities, again, would be to start looking at are there ways for you to get more close to what it says in state policy in or state law in terms of where you place your bus stops. Are you willing to consider moving bus stops to up to half a mile? It is not a requirement, but you have that flexibility. But what that does, as we know, is it does require students to walk a little bit further. And, and Sylvania prides itself on providing the, the level of service in which parents are not having to walk their students that far. Run reduction does not necessarily, again, uh, equate a route reduction. I think that's important to note. Just because you have time and space on a specific run on a tier does not mean a full bus can be removed. And because the changes with bell times are, are currently um, one of the primary constraints, it, there, there's not an opportunity to really consolidate those runs in a way to become more efficient. And when I say consolidate, when you consolidate, in theory, that provides you the opportunity to free up a bus and a driver to do something else, maybe to dedicate 
dedicate it solely to another route or another run or another school, but you don't have that opportunity because of the constraints with your bell times um, and again with where your students are currently residing and attending schools. Conclusion, uh, Sylvania's challenges primarily are attributed to what school districts across the nation are facing. Your, your school bus driver shortage, um, you do have conflicting public and non-public school requirements in terms of, again, the geographic area in which students are residing versus where their schools are based. Um, geographically based attendance, when you have a traditional transportation system, students live in, a, in an area, they're assigned to the school and that's where they go. But when you are operating with a more school-based or a school choice program or the opportunity to select schools that, that benefit your students most, while that, that certainly um, is, is an opportunity for parents to ensure that their students are getting the educational um, services that they need and the preferences that they have in terms of how their students receive education. From a transportation perspective, it makes it very difficult to operate in a manner other than what Sylvania is currently doing. Uh, again, time constraints are particularly problematic in the afternoon as we, we demonstrated in the bell time schedule and the 29 different start and end times uh, that are, are much more constrained in the afternoon in terms of varying release times. Um, and then the location of the schools. That the, with the majority of non-public schools currently outside of the district boundary and having to provide transportation to those schools, there's not a manner in which you can collect students within the boundary and move them to another portion of the district without utilizing a hub and spoke system. In preparation for next year, one of the things that you know, we've recommended is just making sure that again, from, from a routing perspective, just the ability to publish information early to get routes put together so that parents and community members are aware, having that additional staffing uh, in, in the routing area within the department uh, is critical. Making sure uh, that, that any feasibility, that, that anything that may be possible in terms of aligning links of day, having those conversations now. It may not be possible for the 23-24 school year, but having the community be aware and having public and non-public school partners be aware of the fact that this is an area that could, in the future, yield efficiencies if there's a way to align those links of day and start grouping and tiering schools uh, in a more effective manner. Considering your walk to stop policies, your walk to bus stop and, and walk zone policies, uh, those are opportunities to start moving towards streamlining the length of routes in terms of the number of stops that are on routes. But again, that, that only goes so far if you're unable to uh, affect the change with your bell times. Um, and then last but not least, in terms of next year, Continuing to go through processes like these. I applaud the district for taking the opportunity. And again, I, I would be remiss if I didn't thank the transportation department. Not all the time do we walk into an operation where they're willing to be so transparent and candid about what they are doing, uh, to be able to share the data and information that indicates that they're doing the best they can under the circumstances. Um, but going through this process, auditing routes, making sure that you're uncovering everything that you can to determine if you can become more efficient and making sure that the public is aware of what you are doing to be as efficient as, as you can in current state. Um, I, I think that that's a key part of, of what we recognize throughout the study and, and again, that we feel like is important to communicate um, as we wrap up our findings. That's all that I have, so I will certainly open it up for questions if there are any. I have a question yes, about the, the geographically based attendance and cross district. Is that something that we're doing currently? No, ma'am. So for public schools, for students who attend public schools, they live in an area where they're probably attending their home school, the, the area that's closest, or the school that's within their residential area. For non-public school students, they can reside anywhere in the district and select a school that they want to attend. So right. they would not be geographically based okay. in an eligible student. They're, they're not eligible based on geographic I location. Understand. So that's just pertain, that just refers to the, the, the folks that are choosing the non-public out of district. It's yes, not talking about the way we route our existing schools or have our, dist, our current schools districted. Correct. Um, I just want to make sure I understand. So it sounds like obviously the, the biggest item that we could do to help the situation would be to align start and end times or length of day between our schools and the non-publics. Obviously that's not going to be possible. 
So the only other item we can really look at is walk zones or the that, walk distance. In terms of what could start to make, provide you a little bit more time. So one of the key areas that we focused in on primarily was your middle school routes. There seems to be capacity on those routes, but in the afternoon, you don't have the time <coughs> to really affect that. But what we did notice was that there were situations in which there were quite a few stops on routes. To remove those stops would remove time. However, to remove some of those stops, you would be requiring students to walk further distances. And one of the things that, that again, was a very candid part of the conversation with the Transportation Department is that we have historically provided a high level of service. We've placed stops at locations in which parents are not having to walk students too far. They can still kind of see their students in lines I sight. And one of the unpopular recommendations that we often have to make as, as an outside advisory firm is you've got entirely too many stops on this bus route. If you consolidate some of those stops, you may be able to save five minutes. And five minutes in transportation is quite a bit of time. But at the end of the day, again, particularly in the afternoon, it's the time between those bell times that will still cause you to, to run into challenges. And so while you may be able to gain some efficiency in individual runs by looking at stop placement, it's not going to change the, compl the, the complexion of the entire system unless you make wide scale changes, which are more of your bell times that are impacting the entire system as a whole. Okay. <clears throat> I think we're good. Anyone else have any questions? Well, Micah, thank you You're for your welcome. presentation. Absolutely. It was yeah. quite thorough and enlightening. Um, it's an honest conversation about the challenges that we face here in Sylvania schools, and it <coughs> appears that we are not the only ones across the nation facing these challenges. But we will continue to work with our CNPs and, if nothing else, begin the conversation about what we can do with aligning start and end times and length of school day. As you emphasize, it's not just start and end times, but the length of the school day. And that, of course, will take some time. There's no magic wand to that because with the number of schools that we have, um, what I wrote down was 29 different start times and that's 17 CMPs that are outside of our district that we would need to have come to the table and have a conversation about what the potential of what that could look like. Even if we chunked some together with like times based on their locations throughout the city or the area, it might even be an opportunity. But I thank you and your team for providing the results of this study. We certainly appreciate it. Absolutely, thank you for having me. Thank you. Okay, we are with you. Oh no, this is our first opportunity for public partic participation for items that are on the agenda. We have none, so we are with you, Mr. You, Mr. Pope. Uh, I have uh, just two items, so we can do it separately if you want tonight. Uh, item 4.1, issuance and sale of tax anticipation notes uh, for the purpose of general pro uh, permanent improvements. Uh, we're gonna use that for some <coughs> facility upgrades. Uh, we have some needs for uh, at our athletic complexes and transportation. We have several uh, buses that we're gonna need to purchase and uh, this will allow us to, to identify, we've identified the needs, be able to address those needs uh, in a short term uh, through our permanent improvement fund. I move approval. Second. Any questions or comments? <clears throat> Call the roll. Julie? Yes. Kim? Yes. Tammy? Yes. Greg? Yes. Jill? Yes. Uh, 4.2 is just appropriation or amended certificate changes for the month. Uh, we had just um, a few uh, for the month. I highlighted those in yellow in one of the documents. So we've got to submit that to the county. I move approval. I'll second. Any questions or comments? Okay, call the roll. Kim? Yes. Tammy? Yes. Greg? Yes. Joe? Yes. Julie? Yes. All right, Dr. Motley. Thank you. Um, I will begin with item 5.1, which is the recommendation to approve a field trip <coughs> for our Southview High School Orchestra um, with Megan and Samantha, who are our directors, and they will be traveling to New York on April 5th, 2024. They are a year out. I'm so proud of them. Okay. <laughs> Advanced <laughs> application. <laughs> I'm over approval. I'll 
I'll second. Any questions or comments? Good. Call the roll. Tammy? Yes. Greg? Yes. Joe? Yes. Julie? Yes. Kim? Yes. Thank you. Um, tonight it is my pleasure to recommend item 5.2, the appointment of Kelly Kohler as principal of Whiteford Elementary. A little approval. I'll second. Okay, any questions or comments? I do have a few comments. Kelly is here in the audience tonight just to tell everyone a little bit about her. Uh, she has served as the Whiteford Elementary principal part-time because she has been split between two buildings for the past year. But she comes from, from um, Champaign, Champaign, Illinois. She served as an elementary assistant principal at Kenwood Elementary. She also has served as a special education teacher for 10 years, I do believe. Um, she received her <coughs> bachelor's degree from Eastern Illinois University and her master's degree from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. And her master's is in the area of education policy, I believe, and organizational leadership. Um, she's been a great part of our team for the last year, and we congratulate her on this position once the board approves it. <laughs> so thank you for coming tonight. Congratulations. Congratulations. Okay, call the roll. Greg? Yes. Jill? Yes. Julie? Yes. Kim? Yes. Tammy? Yes. Congratulations, Kelly. I don't know if you have any words that you want to share or say. <laughs> pleasure we look forward to it so now the work really begins we're going to start Tim's going to email you several times a day all that good stuff <laughs> great thank you I would like to recommend item 5.3 which is payment in lieu of for the parental contracts for the 2022-2023 year submitted as um, attached I'll move approval I'll second any questions or comments these are for this school year? Yes, they are. Okay. Call the roll. Jill? Yes. Julie? Yes. Kim? Yes. Tammy? Yes. Greg? Yes. Thank you. I recommend item 5.4 uh, for the board to provide a resolution to authorize the solicitation of professional design services for the development of a facilities master plan. I'll move approval. I'll second. Any questions or comments? All right, call the roll. Julie? Yes. Kim? Yes. Tammy? Yes. Greg? Yes. Jill? Yes. Thank you. I also would like to recommend for a first read several policies for item 5.5. And that's all of my recommendations for this evening. Um, are there any questions or comments on the policy? For, I know we're not voting, but is there any? Okay, no discussion. Did on everybody get theirs earlier? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure. Okay. Okay, good. All right, we are with you, Mr. Dabersky. Thank you. I am recommending approval of items 6.1 through 6.4 on a consent agenda basis. 6.1 are licensed new substitutes. 6.2 is a licensed unpaid leave of absence. 6.3 are as a license resignation and retirement date change. 6.4, license extra duty. Remove approval on a consent agenda basis, item 6.1 through 6.4. A second. Okay. Any questions, comments? We'll call the roll. Kim? Yes. Tammy? Yes. Greg? Yes. Jill? Yes. Julie? Yes. Thank you. I am recommending approval of items 7.1 through 7.5 on a consent agenda basis. 7.1 is classified extra hours. 7.2 are classified new hires. 7.3 classified contract recommendations. 7.4 is a classified personnel change. And 7.5 are classified resignations. I'll move approval on a consent agenda basis, item 7.1 through 7.5. I'll second. Any questions or comments? Call the roll. Tammy? Yes. Greg? Yes. Jill? Yes. Julie? Yes. Kim? Yes. 
Thank you. I am recommending approval of items 8.1 and 8.2 on a consent agenda basis. 8.1, our athletic volunteers for the 23-24 school year. And 8.2, our supplemental positions for the 23-24 school year. I'll move for approval on a consent agenda basis, items 8.1 and 8.2. I'll second. Any questions? Okay, call the roll. Greg? Yes. Joe? Yes. Julie? Yes. Kim? Yes. Tammy? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so now it's time for our board committee reports. Greg, do you have anything? Um, so you all got your <coughs> um, centennial passes for this year. Um, like I say, that gets you into the local events at uh, Centennial Terrace, not, not the National Acts, but a lot of local stuff. Um, we had a Sage Yard meeting. There was really nothing new to report from that. Um, went to a CIC meeting. Um, not much from that. And then we voted on the facilities, uh, so there are qualifications that we're going to go out for. That's, we're looking at doing a facilities master plan, so we're going to look for qualifications from architecture firms or master planning firms that can help us with that. So we're just kind of getting going with that. And that's all I have. Uh, Sylvania Prevention Alliance, I think we meet this week. We're still in the process of uh, looking for a new executive director and sort of a reorganization. Um, I did facilities with Greg. He already covered that. I did get to go see Anything Goes at Southview. It was fantastic. One of my favorite shows I've seen at Southview. Um, I also got to go to a, a song ACAP festival that was at Southview. They had some colleges there in Northview and Southview who represented really well. Uh, Superintendent's Art Show I went to. At, oh, at the high school. At the high school. I was blown away. I mean, the it's talent amazing. was incredible. Like, those kids were so, um, so it was really it was awesome. Um, today I got to go to uh, signing day for the arts at Northview which was really fantastic. I have to say that, you know, Mr. Heath, Mr. Wachowiak, uh, Mr. Davis, Mrs. Mrs. Davis, um, Mr. Creech, Mrs. Roth, they did such a great job. There were 10 kids that were going to several colleges and that some of the colleges were represented, like there was somebody there from Bowling Green, somebody was there from Ohio University, like talking about the kids and, you know, it was just really fantastic. They've done it for like three years now and this is the first time I had attended it. I'll never miss it again. It was really fantastic. So that's it. That's cool. Yeah, it was really good. The only thing I have is <clears throat> communications. Everyone saw the, the newsletter went out. Looked great. I've gotten some positive feedback from the community on that. That's all I have. Jill? Um, SCA LMRC is meeting tomorrow. And um, some main community services were meeting this week. Phase two for a strategic plan for that. Pretty much all I've done in the last two weeks is go to track meets. But um, <laughs> <laughs> last Friday, I did have the opportunity to go to a luncheon, um, kind of in my other capacity, but this was through the Toledo Bar Association. Um, it was honoring um, essay winners for their essay contest, which was about the cornerstones of democracy. And in past years, I mean, I've been watching this for years, and. Um, there's usually, there's often one Sylvania child maybe who went a student. And, and that's amazing because they get like 150, 200 um, essays. Um, they give out, there's three levels. There's um, junior, senior, which is division one, freshman, sophomore, which is division two, and then seventh and eighth grade, which is division three. So there's a lot of opportunities. Um, anyway, it was really exciting this year because um, there were two children from McCord who won, and um, they're both in Mr. Budis's class, and then Mr. Budis's daughter also won, so <laughs> Mr. Budis is kind of the connecting um, thread there, but the two students, are, the two McCord students are Logan Call and Braden Stewart, and then um, Samantha Budis also won. And I just have to say the, um, the Toledo Bar Association Foundation pays, um, there's kind of an honor, a little honorarium, honorarium that comes with that. And they doubled it this year. So the first prize winners got $450, and the second prize got $300, third prize got $200. So substantial money for the for you know <laughs> for junior high kids especially. Yeah, Taylor Swift. So it was pretty cool. <laughs> I, it was a really nice opportunity, and the parents and the teachers were invited. It was wonderful. Okay. Thank you. We are now <clears throat> at our second opportunity for public participation for non-agenda items. Okay, we have none, so now 
I move that we go into executive session for the purpose of discussing employment and litigation. Employment of public personnel and um, pending litigation. I'll second. And we will not be taking action after executive session. Okay, call the roll. Uh, Kim? Yes. Tammy? Yes. Greg? Yes. Joe? Yes. Julie? Yes. 